Hey, let's welcome in our uh, first guest of this second uh, half hour of the program, Senate President Craig Blair. Craig, good morning. How are you? Good morning, and twice in one week. Hey, John, just while we got on the phone, you know they paid us $150 each to be on on Tuesday morning. <laughs> Are you getting taken care of like that? No, I'm not, but then, you know, I'm not an elected official, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm joking about the $150, but I brought it up in there to, uh, on Tuesday morning. I was trying to get you guys a raise. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're just stirring it up a little bit is what you're doing. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I think is going on here. I yeah. know how you guys take care of each other. I get it. I get it. That's hey, why I wasn't allowed to be in the room. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to reply to that one. but uh, so. That was a direct order by the mogul. Hey, uh, speaking of the, the show that we did earlier this week, Craig, that had uh, uh, Clay Riley, Roger Hanshaw, you, uh, Jason Barrett, of course, Mike Hornby, where it's here as well. How often do you get a chance to have a meeting like that in Charleston with members of the House, uh, people who are in leadership in the House, like Roger, who's the Speaker of the House, of course, different different parties uh, or committees or whatever, just to get together and kind of figure things out? Uh, that happens at least once a week of in the off season. Then, say for instance, if we're moving into a special session, of uh, then it can happen two or three times in a week. And uh, let's not leave out the governor's office also of uh, that, that we work together. Then we have special issues uh, that we deal with. Uh, and when that's taking place, let's say that somebody's thinking about economic development. We all c converge either on the governor's uh, conference room or the Senate president's conference room and we sit down and have discussions that happens two and three times a week as well well that's good and i hope a lot of stuff gets done at that time hey yeah the, the, we've got a part-time legislature but the thing about it is is that the senate and the house actually have full-time employees i tried to talk about this during the campaign it didn't do any good uh but you got to keep the train rolling the economic development going people expect to see the the president and the speaker and being involved in the game as we move through of improving our economic circumstances in the state of West Virginia. Do you have any revenue numbers for us for how July went? These things are still so warm that came on my desk just a few minutes ago that I can feel the heat off the front. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, the, the, so I was a little bit worried whether they get here in time or not, but I got a good team upstairs in the finance department. So for our fiscal year, for the first month in, for 2025, we were $4.9 million, so that's $5 million rounded off above the revenue estimates. I would also caution that that number is a little misleading because $7 million has been transferred out of the uh, personal income tax reserve fund to be able to return money to the personal income tax. So what I'm getting at is we tried at water for the month of July, and that's not uncommon that uh, the month of July uh, comes out flat, being summer, of uh, the vacations, everything going on like that. Uh, now, when it comes to personal income tax, we were below collections, uh, almost $9 million below the revenue connect. Uh, collections, whereas last year at this time, we were almost $14 million above severance tax collections was down also by $1.2 million. Last year, though, that we were almost $24 million underwater. So that market, and that's got a little bit to do with reporting uh, also for the, when the severance tax of collections come in. Uh, sales and use tax, I pay a lot of attention to this one because it gives you an identifier of the strength of the economy. It was $2 million below revenue estimates for that. Last year, though, it was $5.5 .5 million. Corporate net, that's the shining star, $8.3 million above the revenue estimates. Last year, it was 10. So we can see a little bit of a softening effect, but I wouldn't uh, be too concerned about any of it at this point in time. Rainy Day Fund has $1.187 billion dollars in it and we actually transferred out 
of that number, 78.5. So you can add that back in because in 90 days we'll restore that loan. That's something that takes place every year mm -hmm. to being able to manage uh, the, our finances in the state. So that takes place all the time. Then the last uh, topic on it is unemployment data. And for the month of June, there was 8,846 people drawing unemployment. Now, you can ask all the questions you like. 8,000 in the whole state? Yep. I know. It's, it's, uh, it's been as low as six or seven uh, on that. So, you know, if you want a job in the state of West Virginia, there's no problems by finding it. There is still help wanted signs everywhere. Job opportunities abound. Uh, most of the time what you do is see that uh, a company is uh, to, to laid off because of going out of business or restructuring or whatever it may be, something like that. And the day-to-day -day of where somebody is working and they get laid off. And I don't mean like mass layoff, but... Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I got to be careful on how I say it because, it, it, well, I'll go ahead and do it. I don't care. Uh, people <laughs> get fired for not doing their job, and the next thing you know, they're drawing unemployment. And I got a problem with that, to be quite honest with you. When you get canned from your job because you weren't doing your job, you shouldn't be able to get an unemployment check. That's Craig Blair's position on that. Uh, I get it if you're, it's no fault of your own, but if you're not doing your job, you shouldn't do it. Now, there's supposed to be rules in place to make it so you can't get an unemployment check if you get fired for, do, for cause. Okay, uh, but I've also seen where that didn't make any difference, and they wrote to check anyhow. Craig, in August, I don't know if it'll be on the governor's call or not, but is there an, an attack plan for unemployment reform when you folks gather again later this month? There's a couple different approaches to doing it. Of not this past year, we had a different version from the previous year. The Senate is hot and heavy on this. Uh, and what we do is call it indexing. Right now, you can get 26 weeks of unemployment, and I think you can draw $624 maximum unemployment. And my logic is is that you ought to be able to pay them more up front when they first become unemployed, and then the longer you're on, then the less you get on unemployment. That's basically what indexing is. Um, there's another approach to doing this, and I came up with this on the last day of the session this year. <clears throat> and I just got done telling you about our corporate net mm -hmm. of that is – 8.3 million above our revenue estimates just for the month. Uh, businesses are profitable in the state of West Virginia again. And if I had my way about it, I think I would take $50 million a year out of the general revenue fund that comes from the corporate net, and you put that into the unemployment reserve fund, uh, the unemployment trust fund, excuse me. And what that does is it makes it so that you got a stable revenue stream that you know that is predictable on that, and then you buy down of uh, what the employers pay up to. Uh, it used to be that you paid unemployment up to the first $12,500. We've got that down to 9,500, but many states are still below that. And I'd like to see the state of West Virginia to get to the $7,000 range. Here's the reason for it. You hear people talking about, well, we spent $200 million to bring new court to the state of West Virginia. If you actually got the unemployment down and got rid of the personal property tax on equipment machinery for businesses over a million dollars, you would, to, to, to attract new court could only cost $50 million instead of 200, 250 million, whatever it was at the time. You see where I'm going with that? Yes. What you do is you make yourself so attractive to business that it's hard to say no. Then the only real problems that we have is workforce and terrain. Mm -hmm. If you did those two things, those are the last two things that really need to be done to make it so that we're attractive to business. And by the way, we're attractive to business right now. But what you want to do is get them all if you can possibly get them. I'm greedy. Sure. I want population shifts. So in regards to bringing new businesses in, because of the limitations of the population, there's only so many people here, do 
the businesses count on bringing many people with them as they move into West Virginia to fill out their workforce? Well, they can, and lots of times, like Nucor, they brought some of commercial metals in the eastern panhandle. They brought some, but then they hire of locals as well to come into that. But here's where the trick comes. The greater demand that you put in the workforce, the higher the wages are. The higher the wages are, the more attractive it is for people to actually go to work or move to the state of West Virginia for employment. All you have to do is go to the oil shale fields of the Dakotas when there was a boom up there and salaries is up and populations doubled overnight of up there and so that same dynamic can take place in West Virginia and then when you want to talk about revitalizing uh, the downtown areas when you put that type of demand on housing and all then people that are making good wages come in and buy up the dilapidated or the properties that haven't been taken care of, for lack of a better term, and they invest in them. We've seen that take place in uh, the city of Martinsburg from the, the 1970s, 80s, and look at it now. Uh, it's a tremendous improvement uh, in downtown Martinsburg, and it will continue to grow as you see the population base grow. So I, I want to I go back. To, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, good. I want to go back to the employment numbers. Do we count um, part-time and full-time both as, a, as employed when we talk about the employment numbers? No. And uh, I, so I, part-time, I don't, to be honest with you, I, I'll have to get back with you on that because I, I want to answer it accurately, and I'm not exactly sure. But I do not believe that part-time is included on the employment numbers because I do not believe that you can draw unemployment when you have a part-time job. Because I would tell you seasonal, the, the, you, seasonal you can, seasonal you can, part time you may not. Right. Okay. Okay. So, I was just going to say that, that uh, anecdotal data that I have shows, <clears throat> excuse me, around this area, the Eastern Panhandle, um, a good percentage of the available jobs are exactly what we were just talking about—the seasonal, part time type um, em employment. Finding the the full time work that is not construction or food service is really difficult to find. Just throwing that out. Well, the, I, I would argue the, against that. Procter & Gamble's hiring, Clorox is hiring, CMC is going to be hiring. Uh, you've got many, many manufacturers that are looking for good employees to come to work that will show up and be drug-free. Uh, those jobs are readily available here in the Eastern Panhandle, and the fact is, is they're not just in the Eastern Panhandle. You can go out of state and find those jobs as well. And then when it comes to the construction industry, those are good jobs. I've been in that industry for most of my life, and uh, th those are really good jobs uh, for the skills, skilled trades. Mm -hmm. Senate President Craig Blair, our guest here on the program. Craig, next week I'm going to have on the program uh, two different candidates from the Libertarian Party. And in the past when I've asked them about how to attract new businesses into West Virginia, the one thing they agree on is that we should not be giving any money to a business to move into West Virginia, nor should we provide money for infrastructure improvements in any way. Uh, surrounding states do that. If West Virginia stopped doing that, would it still be possible to attract these businesses? No, it wouldn't be possible, and that's a utopian way of looking at things. And I'm sorry, I, actually, I agree with them. I don't like tax credits either. Uh, and we do make $283 million in tax credits a year. But West Virginia is not in a position to write the rules of the game and how it's played. So you must go in and play by the rules of the game, and then when you become number one, you can start writing those rules. But until then, we don't have the luxury of being able to do that. Uh, and so we have to play by the rules of others to be able to bring ourselves to the top to be able to get there. I want to shift to the extraction industry in West Virginia and those revenues, uh, Craig, which dropped uh, below the uh, budget uh, estimate there. And I know you folks kind of lowered the estimates for those revenues in the past. Were these also lowered and then still fell below that amount, or were these revenues raised with a uh, different expectation? No, the same revenue estimates as last year. And so there's no problem with that. Let me look through here and see what the revenue estimate is. 
It may not even be on. Nope, it's only here for the month. I don't have it for the year. Excuse me. Excuse me, I do have it. 400. No, I'm not quite sure. That because I'm looking at this number and I know that that's not accurate. So I'm showing 406 million. And I know that we're using a lower number than that. Okay. So is is there a concern that it missed estimates? No, no not at all. Uh, as I said when I was uh, reporting it earlier, that the way that severance tax co collections come in, some months are stronger than others. Mm -hmm. And it's all got to do on when the payments are made and how it comes in. So not everything is set up so that it's uh, where you make your payment by June the 30th for your taxes. You see where I'm getting at? Yes. Or June the 15th. There's a lot of flexibility in that in different things. And even within the industry, whether it's oil, gas, coal, um, there's – different dates set for that. So there's lots of times that we see that, um, and I'm not concerned about this trend at all. In fact, we're better than what we were last year, and I don't have the numbers in front of me from last year, um, but I can tell you that we ended up our fiscal year above the revenue estimates. Give me a second, and I'm pulling off that yeah, clipboard sure. I brought in with me yesterday, or um, on Tuesday. And I do have those estimates in the back of it. I just got to find it here. Doesn't make for good radio when I do this, but it's all right. We'll plow through. Okay, I uh, just found it. Uh, for the fiscal year 2024, the severance uh, tax collections, we were above the revenue estimate for the year by 55.8 million dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay even though in the month of June that we were $3 million below the revenue estimates. Now, you have to keep in mind that we had a wonderful year in 2023. Yes. Well, for that year, it was $946 million above the estimates. When, yeah. the, when the estimates are released for the month, are you just taking an annual figure estimated and dividing it by 12, or do you go month to month and account when you do the estimates for the difference in cash flow? They're, they're month to month, and uh, there's incorporated in those months. Um, when they estimate them, they do them historically by month. So if you know that January is a bad month, then those estimates are going to be lower uh, for that month. The overall estimate for the year is the same. Uh, but then they will actually lower those estimates. Then April normally is a hot month. May is a hot month uh, for, for revenues coming in. Those estimates will be higher for that month overall. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you anticipate if uh, there is another, uh, I guess the trigger is going to be 4%, if there's another uh, 5%, do you then have to adjust the uh, the revenue estimates because of the state income tax reduction? No. Uh, do, do, do you, well, that, wait a minute. I'll have to take that back. I guess you would on the personal income tax, but all the other revenue estimates would actually remain the same. Uh, and so the answer to your question is yes. You just didn't ask it the way I under, needed to understand it. <laughs> I'll work on that. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> well, it took me a few seconds for me to think it out. That's okay. Uh, but, and make no mistake about it, that I, I've been saying that I'm not in favor of doing the additional 5% mm -hmm. uh, unless we take care of some of our liabilities that are out in front of us, and they're significant. Uh, there, there's $600 million of base building and another $600 million of one-time expenses, and we've got to be able to manage those. Now, the, maybe not all that will come to pass, but you've got to be able to budget in such a way that you anticipate those things, and then if you can take them off the table, then that's money saved for the taxpayer, and you're able to then truly do it. Nobody wants to come back. Uh, nobody, no legislature wants to come back and vote for a tax increase. And so you don't want to get out over top of your skis on this 5% or additional 5%. And I get where the governor's coming from. He wants to do th this. Uh, but I'm, uh, to, look, I'm a fiscal hawk, 
and we got here because of a lot of the things that I, I wanted to do to, uh, to make it so that we could see these returns on the investment. And very little of it had anything to do with COVID money. It had to do with how we manage our dollars in the state of West Virginia. Uh, and now it's paying dividends for our people. So, Craig, look into your crystal ball for a minute. And assuming that the, uh, the winners of the primaries then go on to win the general, uh, what do you think is the future of the flatline budget? I think the future of the flatline budget is strong because it's been proven in the state of West Virginia, and we're the only state that's done this, uh, that it pays dividends. It is paying to, to nowhere in this country have you seen the amount of tax reductions that we've done and then increases in revenues while we still invest in ourselves whether it be the roads the infrastructure the broadband uh, the deferred maintenance as we've been doing pay raises which are base building for not just the teachers but school service personnel and our state employees we've done all those things while we've controlled the flatline budget we're squeezing out the efficiencies in our state government uh, I'm telling you, we're the only state doing this, and that what we've done is actually a commodity. Okay, this should be replicated in every other state as well as the federal government. Okay, because it's working; it's proven it's working. Sometimes under adverse circumstances. Can you do an eight or nine percent reduction in the personal income tax and a five percent pay raise next year, Craig? No, that 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 would definitely be off the table if you did that. Now, but keep in mind, though, if you do uh, that, to, 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 the four percent that that could that's a four percent reduction for the teachers too. Okay, so what they pay on personal or a personal income tax in the state of West Virginia. Let's say you're making fifty thousand dollars a year, and you pay West Virginia three thousand dollars in tax, and we are able to eliminate twenty percent of that. Well, then you see that back. What is that? Six hundred dollars? Yes. That that's money back into your pocket. That's a pay raise as well. But instead of just doing individual pay raises, of uh, we're doing it across the board for all employees uh, that work, everybody in the state of West Virginia. But we need to still maintain, in my opinion, the ability to do these 5% pay raises for our teachers, our state employees, and our school service personnel, because you'll find out that, in, just like in the Senate, we used to have over 50 employees. We've got 32 now. We've got more people or less people doing more work and getting the job done better than what it was before. Back when the Democrats was in charge, I hate to say this, but it's true, their idea of economic development was to create more government jobs. Our idea of the economic development is less government jobs and more private sector jobs. They create, that's where true profit comes from. I know it sounds like a broken record, but taking something of raw material, turning it into a product that somebody wants to buy or growing something or mining something is where true profit comes from. Everything else is peripheral. You know, <laughs> we, we, we're out of time. John said that would have to be a very quick comment. No, nope, it's not. Nope, no. <laughs> In that case, <laughs> hey, can I have one more thing then? 30 seconds. Hey, Writing books like John, that's peripheral, okay? Uh, but he does uh, make it so that he you use the pulp from the timber industry, and that does help. So I'll give you a little bit there, John. <laughs> 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 Thank you, gentlemen, for having me on today, and to all your listeners, have a good day. Thank you, Craig. We Take appreciate care. it. Senate President Craig Blair with the July revenue numbers hot off the printer, apparently, right off the printer, too. So that was pretty good. We appreciate that. Thank you, Craig and staff.